So welcome. Um, we're here at Town Meeting TV. I am joined by Robin Lloyd and Greg Guma, two icons in our local community media landscape. Um, Robin Lloyd, of course, the publisher of Toward Freedom and a filmmaker, um, and Greg Guma, um, who's here to share a little bit also about the latest book, Managing Chaos, Adventures in Alternative Media. Um, Greg, let's start with you and just give us a little, you know, the the brief through line of how you got started in um, alternative media. Yeah, and the book gets into that to some extent. Um, I came here to Vermont in 1968 right out of college, and one of the first jobs that I got was for a daily newspaper, which gave me some very basic training in meeting deadlines and meeting people and interviewing and getting to know Vermont. Um, and I went from that to a number of other jobs in government. You were started at the Bennington Banner. Bennington Banner, Banner yes, the daily newspaper when there were still a lot of dailies in Vermont. Uh, and uh, so I went from that into a government service for a while, but came back to to media in the late 70s when the alternative media was really getting started in Vermont and was editor of the Vanguard Press, which was one of the first successful um, alternative weeklies um, in Vermont. And, and eventually, sort of uh, subsequent generations, you had Vermont Times and Seven Days ultimately as a very successful weekly. And uh, so uh, many years later, after doing that and also working with Robin on Toward Freedom, which was a uh, monthly magazine and newsletter, um, I was offered the job to work at Pacifica, which is a uh, listener-supported uh, radio network uh, based in Berkeley, but with stations all around the country, New York, Washington, D.C., Houston, L.A., um, and Berkeley being the, the main, the big ones. And that gave me insights into how these kind of democratic media organizations run and some of the pitfalls. And the book, to some extent, is reminiscences, the evolution of my life in journalism and alternative media, but I also say it's a bit of a cautionary tale because it's pointing up the difficulties of running democratic <coughs> institutions. And I found, as I worked there, that there was an analogy uh, to problems that society at large are experiencing in America. Great, thanks. And Robin Lloyd, maybe give us a, also your through line. You come from a media-making family, of mm -hmm. course, going back to Haymarket. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your history and how you came to be involved in alternative media. Yeah, well, I guess it, it started with my great-grandfather, Henry Demers Lloyd, who uh, is was a writer and a socialist and ran for office in Illinois and wrote a book. Um, um, Wealth Against Commonwealth. Wealth Against Commonwealth, yes. And I think that's such a wonderful title because it's what's happening today that th the people with wealth are using it against the, the Commonwealth so often. So, uh, so Henry, back in the day, did wonderful, uh, wrote books and did wonderful things. My, uh, and my father, um, uh, I'm skipping over, my grandfather, who did a variety of things, uh, he joined the, uh, the Communist Party in the 1920s, and then he became a conservative and went to live in Jamaica. Uh, but my father, uh, William Lloyd, was uh, followed the path of his grandfather Henry, and uh, and really wanted to uh, create a newsletter on on uh, on world affairs and uh, the non-aligned movement, and that was kind of. What does his, that mean, the non-aligned? Yeah. Movement? Well, I mean, if. Those of us who lived through the Cold War and saw how polarized uh, the world was, the non-aligned movement was an abs absolutely Im imperative and I important uh, movement. It was saying, we don't want to be a part of the uh, Soviet Union or the United States. We want to be independent. We want to do our thing. And of course, that gave them a certain power because then they were wooed by both sides. And, uh, uh, but they um, are, toward freedom, 
focused a lot on that movement in the what in the late 50s and 60s starting in the early 50s i mean yeah. at that point international reporting was very poor and uh, a lot of new nations were being formed after the second world war yeah. and a lot of them did not want to be uh, part of what uh, was described then as superpower rivalry, and so they were forging a third path, um, independent of the two superpowers. And Nehru in India was one of the prominent uh, people in it. But it sort of combined countries in Africa and Asia, um, and toward freedom was trying to um, uh, bring some light to a subject that wasn't really covered by a lot of the conventional media. Mm -hmm. And Robin and I uh, sort of took over toward freedom from her father in the 80s, um, and I was editor for a number of years, and she was publisher, um, uh, and uh, until it sort of stopped printing, actually, after 52 years or so. It was an online like, publication. Now, now it's, uh, it became an online publication, yeah. but it was, a, it was a print newsletter published eight times a year from 52 to over, past mm -hmm. 2000. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, you know, a, a, Toward Freedom was, a progressive look at world affairs. Um, and for me, it kind of was a way for me to sort of become less provincial and less focused exclusively on Vermont and national politics and to really get an education yeah. in world affairs. So you say it was a progressive look, and that's an interesting distinction from alternative media. So the term alternative media gets thrown around and has a different place in 1970, 1980, even 2000 than it does today. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about, and maybe Robin, what your experience was editing toward freedom and how that, you know, what was the decision to sunset it as a publication? Mm. Yeah, well, I, th I think for a while we, we played a very important role. There weren't many publications that uh, were, uh, had the sort of global uh, scope that we did and, uh, uh, but had a particular viewpoint as yeah, well, right? Yeah, 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 and uh, brought in the so-called Global South, and uh, especially Africa. My father was, uh, um, we tra I traveled with him to Africa when I was still a teenager, actually. <laughs> and um, so that, that experience was one of the things that uh, I cherish and I think I refer to to continue my activism today. And um, but uh, we are really um, it became online and it's it, it's an <coughs> important and good looking uh, website right now toward freedom. But we haven't really um, put anything much on onto the website because. Uh, a few years ago, the uh, the board we we were not achieving the filmmak the uh, fundraising mm -hmm. um, uh, goals. goals that we wanted, and so and the and the board decided to let it down. And I uh, I've been trying to keep it going just for a short period of time up to the Pan-African Congress that was scheduled to take place at the end of October. And unfortunately, we learned in the last couple of weeks that that has been, if not canceled, at least um, put off for a period of time. It was to take place in Togo, Africa, Africa mm -hmm. and uh, a number of people were excited about it. We were looking to find writers to cover it when it came and now we suddenly found that it's uh, not going to happen. So I think that story is an interesting story about um, the role of, uh, of the uh, powerful countries, namely especially France in West Africa and how it's been basically kicked out of some countries that the Western powers do not hold the same grip on Africa that they used to. Now it's now um, Russia and China are are uh, wooing Africa, and Africa is African countries are thinking 
thinking over who they want to be allied with. So, And these are the stories that Toward Freedom might publish or be interested in because the mainstream media is not telling those stories or are there not other publications that are telling those stories? Yeah, right. I mean, it's really quite remarkable that uh, Mali and different the, the different countries in West Africa have asked France to leave. And the, one of those states, I think it's Niger, has uh, uranium. And of course, uranium is the most precious metal in the world. And the thought that the United States would not maintain control over the uranium mines in uh, Niger, I believe it is, is, is kind of like, whoa, how can this be happening? So um, there's a lot happening right now, and I wish Toward Freedom was still making some of, covering some of that news. One of the groups that we, um, we have republished articles from is called Africa Stream, and that was just um, criticized by the U.S. government as being a pro-Russian uh, uh, website and uh, and that's had a big impact on it being able to continue because other forces have also kind of turned against it so it's uh, it's for that to uh, fold also I don't know really the details of that but it is is uh, they were very good maybe they were uh, uh, taking information from Russia. So what? I mean, Russia is not the Soviet Union. Why are we so opposed to it? Mm -hmm. The media ecosystem has really changed radically in the past 50 to 60 years. I mean, when I started in journalism, um, and of course, no internet, no no digitization, but um, the problem was there, wasn't a, there weren't enough choices. And uh, certain publications and networks dominated the language and the way public issues were discussed. The problem we have now is, is almost the opposite. It's a problem of abundance, and people are often overwhelmed. And the difficulty, as Robin was suggesting, is finding out what's reliable and what's true. Um, and that's one of the ways in which things have changed. Um, is that uh, the sort of the trust in media institutions uh, has. Uh, has gone down. When I was first starting out, journalists were kind of heroes, you know, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, and mm -hmm. they were the people who uncovered the truth. But I would say, certainly for the last 25 years or more, uh, the media has, has fallen quite a bit in terms of the public acceptance of, of what it puts out. And people can sort of choose their own reality to some extent. And that's part of the problem that we have now is that it's very hard to decide who to trust. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting when you say trust. Did you feel in the 1970s when you were working in alternative publications that there was a big trust in mainstream media? Or do you feel that it's more about that choosing your own reality? No, I think that media was much more accepted. Certainly there were those of us who were in alternative media felt that, that stories weren't being covered. There were certainly large gaps and there was a way of discussing the issues that struck us, many of us, as being biased. But on the other hand, uh, there was a sort of a consensus reality. There were certain things that we fundamentally agreed to. Such um, as? Uh, I mean, uh, such as the, the, the war in Vietnam was projected on uh, TV screens. Despite the government's attempts to spin the war, the truth about the war got out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in a way, journalists were the people who did uncover those things. They were trusted as being truth tellers who cut through the baloney and got some of the messages that didn't want to be told. Now, they didn't tell every story, and those of us who went toward the alternative media, such as in Burlington, where the Burlington Free Press, as the dominant publication in the 1970s and, and beyond, just didn't want to cover certain things. Yeah. They didn't want to cover certain issues. And so alternative publications were needed to, to fill in the gaps, to give voice to the voiceless, and uh, to afflict the comfortable and, and, uh, and comfort the afflicted, as we often say. Mm -hmm. um, and that was then. But digital, the digital age has brought on something very different. Um, you know, 
I am a supporter of citizen journalism, but unfortunately what's also been sacrificed in the era of digital communication is in a sense the reliability of the information. People no longer have a clear understanding of the difference between fact and opinion, um, projection, speculation, and, and what is verifiable. Um, I'm enough of a sort of a classically trained journalist to be concerned about verification, finding out what the source of the information is, what the motive of the people is, and, and, and trying to at least make a fair attempt to get different sides of the story. Um, and unfortunately, one of the downsides of the new media environment is that that, that sort of uh, dedication to balance and to fairness has been sacrificed to a large extent. Now people want to project the message that they want to project. And if that means sort of leaving out uncomfortable facts, that's what happens. So the result is that it's hard to be sure that what you're getting is a true story or somebody's spin. Yeah. Um, both of you were involved, um, you have here this Black Dawn study guide, and of course Robin, and it's in, I think it's in the CCTV archives, a mm -hmm. film that you made about Haiti, mm -hmm. um, also called Black Dawn, is that right? Yes. Um, when we're talking about this, I mean, I'm wondering if you can put yourself in the perspective of, you know, tell me a little bit about what it was like to make this and how you got involved in this work in Haiti. Yes, well, I, uh, I, I traveled to Haiti a number of times, and I, I think the um, passion and the interest I developed in Haiti, it's, it was my first experience in a real third world country. And, and the, the reason for um, Haiti's poverty um, goes back to them declaring independence. And from then on, um, the United States and Western powers were, were uh, opposed to them in a lot of ways. In other words, uh, Haiti, He's a famous uh, Haitian revolutionary. Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines, and uh, and uh, that revolutionary spirit continued for a long time. And uh, so um, representatives were not accepted in as ambassadors to the United States. Well, because there would be no place for they could stay in the 1800s or early 1900s. And um, so uh, I was fascinated with the um, culture there and the African, uh, not remnants, but the, um, uh, the flowering of African um, culture and voodoo. So uh, Doreen Craft and I went there and uh, worked with Haitian artists to create Black Dawn, which is an animated film of Haitian history. It starts with Toussaint and, and uh, Dessalines and goes all the way up to, uh, um, to the president uh, who got overthrown, Aristide, yeah. And uh, so we so we wanted to show that, and, and Black Dawn is our best-selling film in Green Valley Media. Um, it's animated and has the artists has are all Haitian art, are, are all Haitian artists as well. They're visualizing their own history, which mm -hmm. is, makes it unique as a, mm -hmm. as an art film, really, mm -hmm. as as well as historical. Yeah, and talk about that in t in context of alternative media. Like, talk about why it's important that you and Doreen made this film, tell this story. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, part of it is that. Um, you know, animation is uh, a word that is related to animism, and I think that the mystery and interest of, of voodoo is brought out in the film and, and sort of humanized. And um, so at that time, Haiti has been and it continues to be uh, sort of scorned, like right now there is no sort of real government in Haiti, and there are the soldiers coming from, paid for by the United Nations and the United States, I think, 
they're coming from Kenya and they are supposedly um, maintaining peace and are going to bring the possibility of an election there. But meanwhile, these uh, gangs who some people consider to be, um, uh, you know, uh, one of them called the head of the gangs as Aristide with a gun. In other words, that he that the gangs have a social purpose, though in our media it's all portrayed as uh, um, as just extorting criminal types. Yeah. So anyway, I think Haiti is still a fascinating uh, place, and uh, I'm working with some folks to have some talk shows on Haiti uh, in the next few weeks. Just a side note on a personal level, uh, there's a story in the book about how um, after Robin and Doreen were working on the film, and I, I visited Haiti during this period of time too, um, we came back and we did a, a show uh, together, the three of us, mm -hmm. that other people were involved with down at the Church Street Center, which is, was just starting out, and it was called Impressions of Haiti, and we brought back all our impressions and we performed the, the, char the various characters, the dictators, the, the folk heroes, um, and to some extent, this is how Robin and I went from being friends and political co collaborators to being partners and eventually had a son together. And, uh, and in a way, Haiti was part of what brought us together, both uh -huh. traveling there and also mm -hmm. doing this performance piece once we got back. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of kick-started our, our romantic period um, and are working together on a variety of films subsequent to that. We worked on films on uh, Guatemala uh, uh, and another film on Haiti, uh, which I would also recommend, uh, which is more of a, uh, uh, an exploration of voodoo, and, and Robin is the narrator of that film. Mm -hmm. So uh, Robin's been working on, uh, worked on alternative films for, I don't know, at least 20 years or more. Yeah. Um, uh, Peace Train to Beijing, a great film about uh, the, uh, the women's uh, uh, peace train and uh, and that summit, um, and uh, you know, and Doreen, of course, went on to a great career working for City Hall, and uh, this was all sort of happening at the same time. The Haiti film, the Vanguard Press, the uh, eventual election of Bernie Sanders, which is also described in the book to some extent. Bernie and I and Robin and Doreen have all known each other for you know, more than 50 years and been in and out of a lot of different political um, movements and scrapes. Um, and so to some extent, this is uh, reminding people of some of that history, but also uh, how, how my personal life intersected and, and, and uh, how I got together with Robin and the work that we did together. Yeah, and so you're referring to the Managing Chaos Adventures in Alternative Media, which again is told from a kind of storytelling per first person view. Yes, that's the attempt. Is that it's? Uh, I I wanted to write something about Pacifica uh, after I had managed it because I thought it was a significant uh, institution and an underutilized resource. It's it was worth a lot of money. It had stations all over the country, but it really wasn't reaching its potential. And after I worked there, I wanted to sort of set down what I had seen. But in the process of doing it, I decided that it needed to sort of reflect more the evolution of my own thinking, and so I incorporated earlier experiences um, growing up in college, uh, history, a little thumbnail history of the alternative press. Um, after a while, we of course used the word independent media. That came into fashion yeah. starting in the 90s. We didn't use the word alternative. Um, Why, I, what's the transition? What's the difference between progressive, alternative, independent? I have to. I think it's really more about marketing than it is about um, about politics or ideology. Um, uh, I in the in 1990 91 um, when the Vanguard Press, which was proudly an alternative publication, um, the publisher of that and Vermont Woman wanted to start another publication, but they wanted it to be more mainstream. They wanted a certain kind of acceptability, and they didn't, they very specifically did not want it to be called alternative, mm -hmm. because at that point the idea was to sort of gain a certain level of respectability. And um, focus on culture a lot more. Well, that was seven days, that was the focus, They're not so much for the Vermont Times. Uh, uh -huh. um, but I think what I'm pointing out to is, it, yes, progressive, alternative, independent, 
they have slightly different meanings, but I don't really think they're that different. I think it's just a question of what what's marketable at a particular point. Um, uh, you know, the the coalition in Burlington wasn't even called the Progressive Coalition when it began. It was called the Independent Coalition. Mm. It became the Progressive Coalition after about four or five years, um, and so. Some of these terms, you know, is this an alternative media enterprise, CCTV? Would you describe it that way? Well, we call ourselves a community media enterprise. That's another, that's yeah, another, that's descri that's yeah. another descriptor. A lot of the community radio stations that exist around the country would say they are an alternative. Uh -huh. um, but they wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as alternative publications because the suggestion is alternative to what? Yeah. You know, um, well, that term comes from someplace, right? I mean, when Toward Freedom was beginning, was it considered, uh, what, was, what was the nomenclature around that? Was it an alternative publication? Was well, it I, I, don't think, I don't think your father used that term. Yeah, well, I think more, I think progressive yeah. uh, publication, though I'm not sure he would have. I don't think he really even would have used that label as well. I think he was not into labels. I mean, it was called a newsletter on new nations. Yeah. And a non-alignment was the term of art that was the thing that he and the people he was supporting were trying to push, which in the 80s, the green movement served a similar function, a third way, not for the capitalists, not for existing socialism, but finding a separate path. And I think the idea of alternative publications is that they're presenting a slightly different narrative, a different worldview, something you may not have noticed, or something in some cases which has been left out um, by the mainstream press because it doesn't fit into the spectrum of, of what is allowable to be discussed mm -hmm. at a particular time. Yeah, and of course now it's all becoming diffuse because you have right-wing, left-wing, alternative publications, where is the truth, mm -hmm. how do we find out? And there's censorship from both sides, I would say, especially on the issue of Palestine, the fact that um, professors at universities are uh, being told that they can't really advocate for Palestine and, uh, uh, and uh, some of the journals that have, uh, are, are facing censorship and that's a big issue because there's such a big movement on on the issue of freedom for Palestine and ending the war in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Let me, I want to circle back because there is an important part that there's a relationship between the two of you and I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about maybe not your personal relationship but what personally brings you to be passionate about this, to have stuck with this, to have, you know, it's. It's not an easy thing to keep trying to lift up a public Well, I mean, for me, I, I do sort of carry uh, my ancestors with me, and not only my um, great-grandfather, but my grandmother, Lola Maverick Lloyd, who was one of the founders of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, where which we still have a, there is a uh, branch here in Burlington of, of WILF, and um, and so uh, and a number of people who uh, uh, a number of, uh, uh, there's a, quite a presence at the United Nations. In fact, I was there recently for the summit of the future, and uh, and the pact for the future. It was just a few weeks ago, and again, not covered much by anyone. We're trying to get an article on it and toward freedom because um, uh, because it was reaching out and uh, telling news that was not covered much and also the idea of the Pan-African Congress that was meant to happen at the end of October suddenly got canceled uh, and there again we were planning to send people to Togo and cover this uh, important a Congress of which it's the ninth, con it was to be the ninth Congress, uh, meaning that the first one started at the turn of the 1900s and, uh, uh, you know, involved uh, 
many uh, important speakers and uh, and led into um, and was covered by Toward Freedom. And now it's been canceled and we don't know why. I, again, I think it's sort of the power of the uh, the Western powerful forces, in this case France, that put the kibosh on it. It was take place in, in Togo, which is a teeny little country in Western Africa. Yeah, just yeah. sort of near Ghana. What, what, I mean, what's the, are you, are you driven by uh, a sense of rightness? Are you driven by a sense of trust and belief in humanity, curiosity? What's the thing Yes, that well, I mean, you? and curiosity and, and, uh, and, uh, wanting to understand other cultures and finding them quite fascinating uh, and meeting people from um, those other countries. Um, for example, I met a young man from Burkina Faso uh, when I was at the Summit of the Future, which is, uh, again, a very small land landlocked uh, country in Africa that has uh, had a leader named Thomas Sankara, who was kind of the Che Guevara of Africa. And again, very few people know of it, but we have uh, held several Africa Day events here in in Burlington, and one of them was sort of holding Thomas Sankara to the light and uh, and showing that not all African leaders are uh, uh, are autocrats and uh, only thinking of themselves. Uh, so uh, for me, it's been it's it's just the most interesting thing to be involved in uh, to understand the 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 multitude of countries outside of the United States and what their interests are. This is the majority of humanity, after all, and. Um, so uh, being at the summit of the future was was a, a very interesting experience just a few weeks ago. Yeah, and Greg, for you, what's the driving force, and and how does this relationship with Robin help sustain that? Well, I mean, one of the driving forces for me, of, as you mentioned, was curiosity, um, and although, and I've always felt that uh, objectivity in is in journalism or in anything is kind of a mythology is something you work for but what uh, what you're really looking for is some sort of fairness and what motivated me was this curiosity to find out about things i didn't know uh, to explore the other side of things to sort of what's beyond conventional wisdom and i think that's part of what drove me i mean i'm not from a progressive family my parents were in fact republicans and so i had to some extent break away from to some extent early uh, childhood conditioning to find my own way in politics. Um, and I think part of what's a problem now is that there isn't enough dialogue going on. Right now it's a lot of people talking past each other, a lot of people who feel that they have indisputable truth on their side, or in some cases God, um, or <laughs> yeah. historical inevitability on their side. And my interest is in, is in sort of uncovering what has not been known. Um, one of the books I wrote was um, uh, is about restless spirits and popular movements in Vermont. And what it does is it revisits a lot of stories that have been lost along the way. It sort of recovers uh, populist and popular stories that have been have fallen through the cracks. And I think part of that that is the problem that we're having now is that people are speaking in echo chambers. Um, I, I think it would be great. And to, who does that serve? If people are speaking in echo chambers, I think that it comes back to it's it's easy to monitor. It it's it's very easy to monetize and weaponize um, both. Um, it helps you to build a base. It helps you to gain loyalty. Um, I mean, we criticize the cult of Trump, but there are a number of cults out there. We li we're living in the era of cults, um, and and what benefits all cults is to is to restrict the information that people uh, get and to have them reject anything that doesn't agree with their pre-existing conceptions. And what alternative journalism, when it's good, does it asks un uncomfortable questions. It questions authority. It questions assumptions and and asks to open the door 
to a broader understanding of human nature and of, and of conflicts in the world. Um, and I think it's going to be difficult to get back to that given the way the, the media is, is set up now. We're all in these different silos. Um, and you know, there are some who, because a particular silo will tell them what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, Robin and I, we work together on things, but we also have our disagreements. Um, you know, uh, she is more uh, supportive of some of the, uh, the, um, the reportage and so forth that comes out of, say, sources like RT and other sources. I find that to be more propagandistic and, uh, you know, and supporting an agenda toward disinformation. But that's the difficulty now. The difficulty is sorting through what is reliable and what is, you know, motivated by hidden agendas. Mm -hmm. um, Robin and I um, have worked together on films. We've worked together on books. Um, we haven't always agreed on issues. I think my repertorial background gives me a certain kind of distance that her activist background is different. And she's, uh, I would say she's more engaged in, in movements. I'm more an observer, sometimes a participant. Although, to be fair, you did run for mayor and had a political point of view, correct? I have a lot of political yeah, point yeah. of views. Um, uh, yes, and I did run for mayor in 2015 at a time when I felt that the progressive movement was kind of losing its way, um, to be honest with you, is that you know gentrification was coming, the F-35s were coming, um, and the progressive party was kind of lost in that moment. But you know, uh, they and I parted company at that point. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, but pol I'm not a politician. I was, would never have been a particularly good politician because uh, one of the skills that I don't have is that I just don't have this ability to repeat things again and again and again. Uh. I'm, I'm looking for a new understanding of things. I'm too much of a writer and an editor yeah. to be a really good politician. We have to be comfortable just yeah. digging down on that, uh, on one or two simple messages. Let's uh, talk about that just a little bit on the local politics side, or like you, you both have been, I mean, of course you were working with Pacifica in Berkeley but you've both been part of this community in Burlington, deeply invested and involved. And while you go to the World Summit, um, the Summit on the Future, and you're involved in WILF, International League mm -hmm. for Peace and Freedom, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, you're both really involved in local politics as well. And how does this view, this alternative view of the world, inform your involvement here? In Burlington. Yeah, well, um, there's m many uh, events happening. There's this uh, Vermont Palestine uh, conference coming up on the uh, uh, 19th of October. And, uh, but, you know, one area in which we disagree is on Ukraine. Ukraine and I think the, the difference in our perspective is that mine is one of uh, wanting peace and therefore wanting uh, R Russia and the Ukraine and the United States that supports the Ukraine to stop fighting and and get, uh, reach a settlement. And uh, I think Greg feels more strongly that uh, Russia is the violator. And yes, of course, Russia did invade. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, but the larger issue is so many people are being killed, so many Ukrainians being killed and Russians and so on, and our money being wasted in weapons. It's again that, the non-aligned perspective. Yeah, they're again bringing the non-aligned perspective from the long history of toward freedom and making it uh, alive again today. I think that Robin and I have been having a dialogue about politics for 45 years or more since before our son was born. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and, we, and the thing that's great is that we've been able to do this in a civil way to maintain our integrity, to maintain our own uh, positions. You, you can and get it, angry. And, well, you get angry. <laughs> we, we both get angry. There's nothing wrong with getting angry as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I think anger, anger can be liberating as long as it's focused constructively. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that, is that what I think that 
uh, being in the alternative realm allows you to do is to entertain ideas that other people who are existing in the sort of a, the more conventional world have trouble accepting. And it also allows us to have disagreements, but to remain civil and to remain connected and to work on the things that we can work on together, to find common ground where we can. And where we have a difference, well, we make that explicit and, 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 and explore it. And while I was editor of Toward Freedom, we did that in Toward Freedom. Um, and in the Vanguard Press, we, uh, we also uh, uh, allowed a lot of unconventional ideas and ideas outside of the mainstream to be entered in. And, we, and by doing that, we legitimized new voices. And I think that's one of the things that alternative publications that Toward Freedom has done and that Robin does through her active activism is that she elevates and we elevate voices that otherwise would not be heard. And I think that's the secret to the success in Burlington is that we've been able to chart uh, a, a very distinctly different path from a lot of the country. We look at what's happening in America today. There are differences and there are problems in Burlington, but we have not descended past civility in this state. And, and I think that's a blessing and, and, and to some extent, you know, the stuff that we did in the 70s and the 80s contributed to this atmosphere of civil conversation toward a better world. Mm -hmm. And Robin is still working on that. It's, it's sometimes difficult because I get all sorts of emails saying, call your senator and tell him not to uh, send, uh, uh, to cut military spending uh, to uh, Ukraine and other issues and the fact is he's the one person, Bernie's the one person who is actually doing that so uh, I can't, I, I mean I can call him and support him on that and I think that's important but we're so lucky to have representatives that, that uh, go a long ways to support what the progressive movement in, in Burlington uh, approves of and likes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly you have opened up your backyard, your home, your um, work and your efforts to support community conversations and dialogue over mm -hmm. the years. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, what, what's next for you if Toward Freedom is having its quiet moment right now, it's, 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 it's cocooning and trying to, so what's next for you in mm -hmm. terms of using your voice and effort to... Well, well, we're having that discussion right now. In fact, we're in the midst of it, right? Okay. Uh, working yeah. that out. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you, you can help us. Uh -huh. what, uh, well, we're, we're, the, what comes to my mind is, um, is these talks on Haiti finally uh, happening and involving Esther Carlson, who is running for uh, yep. governor and has a uh, a Haitian background, and so we're, in fact, maybe we could do it here instead of AALV and bringing in uh, folks who worked on a film, uh, Bitter Cane, way back in the 80s, but... Dee Dee Halleck, yeah. Yeah, Dee Halleck. So uh, those are something I've been working on, and you were, what were you thinking of? Well, we were discussing doing a doing a book together on, oh, on yeah. the history of Toward Freedom, <laughs> but that's another that's another possibility. Yeah. I mean, my feeling about Toward Freedom today is that it was it was started as an educational foundation that, among other things, published a newsletter on new nations, and the and the focus changed and expanded over the years to incorporate the entire world. But now we're in a slightly different world, and I'm not sure whether another digital publication um, is the way to go. I would like to see Toward Freedom do things in this community to encourage, as I said before, dialogue on important questions. I think the Ukraine war and the struggle in the M Middle East are among them, but not the only ones. Um, and so I would like to see Toward Freedom uh, be active as an educational force, uh, and I think it could be again, but there's a bit of rebuilding that's going to be involved because uh -huh. 
Um, in a way, we maintained a consensus for an awfully long time, but it was inevitable that at some point we would reach a point where the consensus would break down. Mm -hmm. And that did happen over the last five years, and it led to a suspension of publication. So the question is, can we develop a new sense of mission? And I think that's true for Pacifica as well, to bring it back to the book, is that Pacifica was uh, a really breakthrough organization that had a very important mission in the post-war period. But that original purpose was kind of lost, that sense of unity, uh, that sense of why are we here was lost. And I think that's part of what's led to its decline. And I think Toward Freedom needs to sort of assess what are we here for going forward? And who do we want to align ourselves with going forward? And then I think we could make a contribution to education, public education. Whether it's going to be a, through a digital newsletter, um, I, have my, I have questions about that because there's just, as I say, there's so much out there that you have to be distinct, original, personal. There are so many obstacles to overcome. Um, I'm just not sure about what's the vehicle. I think uh -huh. that's part of what uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're having a conversation about. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Well, Robin Lloyd and Greg Guma, thanks for coming in. Again, we started this conversation around the book Managing Chaos, which is your latest book in a series of books that you've published. And we also have here um, the most recent publication, I think, that you're involved with in terms of writing mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um, filmmaking, which is toward freedom celebrating 71 years of global reports from a grassroots perspective. And can folks get this online as well as? Um, yes, yeah. yes. And so this has the stories of a number of people, in, in, including some familiar um, names, like I, I noticed Paula Routley in here, as well as Nat Winthrop, filmmaker, and other folks um, that sort of tells this story mm -hmm. to some degree. Mm -hmm. yep. Appreciate you sharing some Yeah, well, Nat, Nat was both uh, one of the uh, publishers of uh, the Vanguard Press back Correct. in the day, and he's helped a lot of filmmakers, and he was also on the board of, of Toward Freedom for a number yeah. of years. Um, and, and Paula and Pamela, as I said before, were both staffers before seven days um, for, uh, on Toward Freedom. And so, yeah, there's a lot of connections between this alternative media community. It, mm -hmm. it is a community, uh, although a bit of a fractured one. Um, I would say, just to sort of go back to, to the roots, what I'm, what I'm hoping to accomplish with a book like this is both to tell a bit of an origin story, but also to point out some problems. And, and one of the problems is the problem of a, of a loss of a sense of unity, both within Pacifica and also within the country. Right now, we're, we're in a, such a divided and, um, and uh, siloed nation, and we're not really talking to each other anymore. And I think at some point, there's got to be a way to break through that and to re-encourage dialogue and a reassessment of why we're here. And I'm hoping that Toward Freedom and that Robin and I, through our lives and, um, and through the work that we do, we can continue to make some sort of contribution. Thank you so That's much. Thanks, great. Greg Guma. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And this is just the beginning of a continued conversation. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for watching Town Meeting TV, your community media um, station. Mm -hmm.